All right, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. So welcome. We are going to be talking about virtual classrooms and how to engage students during COVID-19. Um, obviously, in March of 2020, about, uh, I don't know, nine months ago, um, we were educating one day with students on the pontoon boat, and the next day we were not. <laughs> and so we kind of had to make it some adjustments. And so we're going to kind of talk about that today. Um, I want to introduce everybody who I've asked to jump on. Um, my name is Nat Draper. I'm the education manager. I've been with JRA for six years. Um, and before that, I was a Henrico County teacher for 16 years um, at Deep Run High School and Tucker High School. Katie, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I am Katie Farrell. I am the senior environmental educator for the James River Association in our Williamsburg office. I have been with JRA for almost two years now. Before that, um, I did environmental education down in Florida for four years. And before that, um, I was doing sea turtle research on the military base Camp Lejeune through AmeriCorps. Great. Charles? Awesome. Good, good evening, everyone. My name is Charles Johnson. I am our senior environmental educator in the Richmond uh, office. Um, Prior to me being with the JRA now three years, um, I've served with AmeriCorps as well as worked with other nonprofits in the greater Richmond area. Um, so now we have been tackling, educating all of our students in the greater Richmond area via virtual education, as well as our Leadership Academy um, and other after school programs. All right, and we have a guest with us. We have actually have two guests. I'm not sure if both guests are here. I know Rodney is here. Rodney, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. I'm Dr. Rodney Culverhouse. I'm the secondary science supervisor for Newport News Public Schools. Great. And we've been working with Rodney as a partner for about four or five years now. Um, and we've been educating all their students live, you know, before COVID on the river with canoe based trips and stuff like that. And we've continued to do some great stuff with them virtually. So I really appreciate Rodney joining us tonight. Miss Sessions, I'm not sure if I didn't see her jump on right in the beginning. She's teaching a class tonight and kind of trying to do both. Miss Sessions, are you there? I don't think no. she's on yet, Nat. Okay, so Miss Sessions might jump on in a minute, but she is a Richmond um, environmental science teacher at Huguenot High School, and we are working with them through an EPA grant. So I'm going to keep moving. So the first thing I want to do is talk to you about the virtual classroom. So this website we created in March and April of 2020. Um, we before before COVID, this did not exist on our web our website, and I kind of wanted to show it to you and take some take some time. Um, so I'm going to click on the live um, website here. Give me one second. Okay, so here it is. Um, if you go to our website and you click on virtual resources, it's right there, virtual classroom. And so back in March and April, all the educators kind of came together with me and we decided to create some virtual lessons for parents and teachers and school systems to use. Um, we have an elementary school resources. We have middle school and high school resources. I'm going to click on the middle school one just so you guys can see it. And if I scroll down, you can see that we have all these lessons, Fish of the James River. We have 360 Scavenger Hunt, which is a kind of a, a, a cool opportunity for um, kids to make believe that they're like scuba diving in the James River and seeing different organisms. Um, and this one right here is Web um, Watersheds and Food Chains. If you click on this, you can see we created a video with Henrico County Schools and there's a kind of like a worksheet that kind of goes along with the video. So anyway, these are all resources that we have available for parents and um, teachers to use and they've been very popular. Um, I don't know the number of hits we've had on, on these um, off the top of my head, but I do know a couple months ago it was quite a few. So um, check those out. Um, elementary, middle, and high school ones available. There's definitely some videos. Not all of them have videos. Some of them are just kind of a, a, a interesting um, lesson on fish or an interesting lesson on reptiles. Um, so yeah, so check that out. Um, let me go back to the Jamboard. So 
how are we engaging students virtually? So we are, we're using lots of different ways. Um, we're using the virtual classroom, which is what I just showed you. We are using Jamboard, which is this presentation here. Um, there is a function of being able to create like sticky notes. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we have polling questions with some poll everywhere software. We do hands-on experiments. So just the other day, Charles and I were doing uh, an, our EPA grant and we were talking about infiltration and runoff. And so I had like a, a bottle of sand here and we showed kids the difference between, you know, of what infiltration means and how water moves through sand. So we're, we're still trying to do hands-on um, lessons as well. We have some pre-recorded videos and then of course we're using Zoom. So I want to talk to you about our first um, virtual um, lesson that we're doing with Richmond Public Schools. It's, uh, it's uh, the three partners are the EPA, the James River Association and Richmond Public Schools. It focuses on every environmental science course in high school here in Richmond. It's mostly ninth and 10th graders. It's approximately 900 students and it's 100% virtual and we're focusing on these two lessons. Um, lesson number one are the effects of land cover and soil on watersheds. And lesson number two is modeling improvements to my schoolyard. And these two labs came from the Shroud um, Water Research Center. And so we've worked with them to kind of be able to manipulate this to fit into the education that we're doing with Richmond City Schools. So I'm going to turn over the next part to Charles. Um, He's going to briefly describe lesson number one and something called the runoff simulator. Charles, it's yours. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so we've breaking down um, how we're working with our high schools kind of in four. Sorry. Share. Yeah, Nat, if you want to just share that for a second and then oh, that's okay. I'll jump in now. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> I was kind of reading it. All right. Excellent. All right, so lesson one, we break it down into two times that we'll work with the class. Um, the title of it is the effects of land cover and soil in our watershed. So we're allowing the students to get a greater understanding of the different landscapes that they may live on near. Um, and primarily we like to focus on the school um, that we're working with, um, just because we know most of the students live around there. Um, so the land cover type is usually similar to the area that they're living in. Um, the next thing that I'm gonna share is the actual runoff simulator. Um, so here, the students get a chance to change the land cover type, the soil type, as well as the precipitation that would fall in a 24 hour rain period. Um, and again, this technology um, is the model my watershed and this is called the runoff simulator. Um, so on the screen here, you can see the precipitations at five centimeters um, evapotranspiration, and then we have our infiltration and runoff. And this all changes depending on uh, the amount of precipitation. So the students can change it all the way up to 21 centimeters. And we can see that significant change in runoff as well as infiltration. Um, and then for students to kind of gain a greater understanding of evapotranspiration, which is evaporation and transpiration, um, they can change the land cover to maybe a forest um, and then you can see that evapotranspiration going up, our runoff drops off tremendously. And in that land cover type, we have a huge infiltration. Um, also students get a greater understanding of soil types. Um, so this is an introduction on the four different types of soil um, that they can find um, from high infiltration, moderate infiltration, slow infiltration, all the way down to very slow infiltration. Um, these words sometimes can be confusing, so it also has the different types of land um, that would be found there from clay to sand and the different forms of loam. Um, so that's our runoff simulator. Hey, Charles. Um, yes, Nat. Let's do a quick little demo for everybody. Let's set the rain for eight centimeters, so it's a pretty good amount of rain. Okay. Let's say we were in the city under developed medium. Okay. And we had soils that were type B, moderate infiltration. Awesome. Cool. All right. So you guys can see um, 
in that area, we would have five centimeters of runoff. We would have 2.9 centimeters of the eight centimeters of rain being infiltrated. And then we would have 0.1% of VAPO. And what we're teaching the kids is that we can actually do some really cool um, best management practices to change the runoff and infiltration numbers. And Charles is gonna talk about that next. Th thank you, Charles. Yeah, no problem at all. And then our second lesson is tying in all the information that they learned from the first lesson. Oh, actually, we actually have a question for you all. Um, so before I get there, what land cover do you all live within? So for this question, we wanna get your feedback just to kind of gain an understanding if uh, maybe you even understand where you live um, as far as land cover. And for that, you can put your response into our chat box and just give us your best guess um, and we like to provide the students with the information as well. So our options would be developed open, developed low, developed medium, developed high. And if you are maybe on the farm, there is cultivated crops, maybe that would be your land cover type. Or even if you were uh, in a super rural area, potentially your land cover would be forest. Um, so from those options, just let us know what you think your land cover type would be where you live. And with this, um, as you all are responding, thanks so much. Um, we like to kind of give the kids a, for instance, uh, if you were downtown Richmond in the middle of Broad Street, your land cover would be developed high. Um, and maybe if you were in uh, Henrico County, far west end, um, potentially you could be developed open, developed low, or even, as we said, that pasture or crop. Excellent, excellent. So I see we have a lot of developed lows, developed mediums. Excellent, excellent. How, how do I get my answer? How do you get your answer? Um, yeah, how do I get it? I just hit chat and nothing, it just jumps around. So at the bottom where it says uh, type message here, if you would like to type it in there, and then all you have to do is press enter or return. Yep. I don't see we'll type message. Okay. Did it work for you? I don't, I don't see type message, so that's... That's okay. okay. I was going to do crops, but that's okay. Okay. Wonderful. I can do it for you, Frederick. No problem. I got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nat. Yep. Awesome. So this is um, kind of how we introduce the Jamboard to our students that we're working with. Um, we make this super interactive to where we'll have questions throughout the module that we're working on um, so that we can make sure our students are engaged. We're getting their feedback. Um, and most importantly, they're understanding the content that we're uh, teaching at the time frame. Um, so thank you all for engaging in that, um, as well as thank you, Nat, for dropping them all onto the Jamboard. Yep, and usually we, we'll, we give students the access to everybody and they can actually do these sticky notes themselves. They can also upload pictures. So it's just, a Jamboard's a really cool um, feature. I'm sorry we didn't have it. Um, we typically use it in Google Meets um, sometimes in Zoom, it's tricky, so. Yes, and as uh, if you could see on my screen, um, this is kind of access that the students would have. It would go to Google Images if they typed in Richmond, and if they wanted to drop in an image for their land cover type, they can also do that. So Jamboard is a really cool piece of technology um, that the students are able to use and utilize. Um, I know earlier, um, a couple of you asked, is it a free platform? Uh, yes, it is. It's a part of the Google. Um, if you know those dots in the right-hand corner, you just click on there, scroll all the way down to the bottom where the other apps are, and you can find Jamboard. Um, all right, let's jump to slide eight. So lesson two is modeling improvements to my schoolyard. So here the students take that background information they get from the runoff simulator, um, and now they get to use more um, I would say like a professional tool. So this is just like we would use in ArcGIS um, or any other mapping technology in the professional realm. So they get to kind of start to 
play with and manipulate um, these modern types of maps. And in this lesson, they will also have the opportunity to add in BMPs, which are best management practices or conservation practices. Um, and on this screen, you can see not super well, um, and I'll actually open up the simulator so that we can see it in a better picture, um, but it also gives you that same data that the runoff simulator gave you. So your evapotranspiration for the land cover, the runoff, as well as the amount of infiltration. Um, so just give me a second and I'll pull up our runoff simulator. I mean, I'm sorry, our uh, model my watershed. So here, as you can see, this is kind of the platform, how it starts. So if, um, if you wanted to enter like your personal address, um, you can see that. Um, and this technology works for anywhere in the continental US. So if you wanted to put somewhere in California, Texas, anywhere, it would actually bring up that information. So what I'm going to do is just pull up the projects um, that we have worked with our student, and it's going to take me right to Huguenot High School. So on my map here, you can see um, kind of a black and white or a black and gray um, mapping of Huguenot High School. Uh, on here, you can change the layers to where they can see it in a satellite image. You can do satellite image of roads. You can do topography. So it's really, really cool piece of technology and even the terrain. So primarily we work within the satellite with roads so that students can get a understanding of kind of what they're looking at. Then from in here, uh, we can add in different best management practices. Um, some of the options would be green roofs, our rain gardens, um, and how that you just click on our conservation practice. And you can see the different six that you can choose from. So our rain gardens, vegetated basin, porous paving, clustered housing, no-till ag, and green roofs. So this is a, a really, really powerful um, piece of technology that we're using with our students so that they can get a greater understanding of the BMPs that they maybe could add at their home or their school. Um, and within the grant too, we have funding so that each of the high schools will be able to put in a BMP within their school after we're finished working with them. Um, so this gives them a great understanding of all the BMPs, uh, allows to see like the different precipitation that would fall in a 24 hour period and how that would change your data for runoff infiltration and evapotranspiration. Um, but yeah, this is definitely one of my favorites. Um, one of my favorite pieces of technology and I'm super fortunate to be able to educate RPS uh, students. Nat, feel free to jump in. Um, Nat and I yeah, always yeah. tag team these lessons and I'm sure I'm missing so much because there's so much within this technology. Yeah, um, thanks Charles. You did a great job. Um, if you go ahead and unshare, I'll share and I'll get ready to show a video. I know there's a couple questions. I was trying to ask answer a couple questions in the text box. Um, we're going to do a 10 minute question period at the end because I feel like if we answer questions now we will We'll go way over seven. So um, let me keep rolling. I want to show you something that we developed in the last month that got some really cool, um, got teachers super excited. So um, back in October, we um, I met with a, a principal from Greenwood Elementary School. His name's Ryan Stein. And he, he's a really outside the box thinker. And he came to me and said, Nat, I really want to get my teachers involved and get them together. They're, some of them are teaching at home. Some of them are in the classroom. I would love to get them all together, socially distance, wear masks, do it safely, and have them team teach and then get all their students, the entire fifth grade, on a Zoom meeting. And so we decided to do that on our pontoon boat, which is 40, 42 feet long. And um, Henrico County sent out a video camera and kind of recorded it. Um, so the teachers, we did a, basically we did a three hour science lesson day. It went from 9 a.m. to 12. And um, I have the video popped up here. So I wanna show you the video, but um, so really quickly, I'm gonna transition. Charles was just talking about our EPA grant with Richmond City Schools. And now I'm kind of transitioning to another type of virtual education which is getting kit, the teachers on the boat, doing a field trip and letting the, the students see their teachers conduct real science. 
Um, and that was kind of a uh, an idea that was fostered by one of the principals. So here that here this um, here it goes. Charles, can you see the the video? Cool. Yes. Good morning, Greenwood Fifth Grader. We just want to welcome you to our first virtual field trip. Now I'm going to get you to mention to Captain Aaron. Good morning, everyone. My name is Captain Aaron. This is my office right here on the danger, and you all are joining me outside in my office today. This is our boat. It's called the Spear and the Jane. It's about 42 feet long, and that's Captain Aaron right there. He's waving to you right now. We're super excited to get started here. And then you should see the link for the James River field trip. It's in the same place that you got the link to join us this morning. It's called the 360-degree scavenger hunt. We're going to give you 10 minutes to answer these five questions. What does it mean to be a schooling fish? These fish are called schooling fish because um, things get me a migration together. Um, very good, Drew. That's the bald eagle. Good job, the bald eagle. We have an example of a bald eagle talent right here. Look at this. This is a fish key. We did five of those um, teacher field trip lessons. We did two with Henrico and three with Hopewell Public Schools. Um, that was something we kind of developed in October and November. And, um, you know, if students are allowed to go back to school, we're, we're hoping to do more of those in um, the spring. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, a lesson we did, um, you know, just a couple, couple weeks ago. Went really well. Teachers and students loved it. I think. One thing we got to remember is that the teachers are, are having, not only are we asking teachers to learn all this stuff virtually, but we're asking them kind of like each school system's different. Some of the this, this school systems are not letting the teachers in the building. Um, and that kind of makes it a little bit of isolation. And so to see the teachers get together like that and kind of really be excited about what they're doing together. And, um, you know, they're just like us, you know, in, in any job, they want, they want to be able to, um, bounce ideas off each other and, and, and see each other. And so that was kind of a really cool thing about these um, virtual field trips with teachers. Um, if you have any thoughts, you can stick them in the chat and we can kind of go ahead and post them on this. We might kind of keep moving because we, we, we're running out of time, but um, Charles and Katie, if you see anything, can you post them? Um, post them on sticky notes and maybe we can talk about a couple of the questions that people have. So if you, if you have anybody has any questions about the, um, the boat trips, you can post them in the chat box and Charles and, and Katie will, will post them here for me.
Um, really quickly, one way we did that technology on the boat was um, we used an iPad. So we did we did find a grant to purchase an iPad, a microphone, um, a, 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 a camera stand so the iPad can sit in a stand and film it relatively um, you know, hands-free. Um, we also brought in um, a Wi-Fi, like a MiFi to take on the boat. They kind of look like this. Um, so basically the internet or the Zoom meeting ran through this device that then went through the iPad. Um, and that's how we were able to do it on the boat. So a couple questions, did, um, did it cost money to create the video or have Henrico come film it? Uh, it didn't cost any money to do it. Uh, Henrico County came out, um, they have a film crew and I think they shared it all with their principals. So that was a really good question. How did you manage the technology connection while out on the boat? So yeah, just like I said, we use this like um, MiFi, it's called a Verizon hotspot or Jetpack, um, And it worked pretty well. We did have the kids all jump off once out of the three hours. And so we had to load them back in and that took a little bit of time. But um, we did have a teacher at the school kind of monitoring the kids too, because sometimes kids, you know, they like to test their boundaries and and they don't handle the chat box well. But overall, the fifth graders were great. I think they had the teachers really warn them to be, you know, um, mature. Um, another question was, was it just a one time deal while you um, did with the other classes? OK, so we had all five fifth grade teachers on the boat and all five fifth grade classes. So it was about 100 kids in the Zoom meeting. Um, so I think I answered that question. What was one of the biggest lessons learned from the virtual field trip. Uh, a lot of lessons I think are learned by these virtual field trips. Patience, um, trying to be as prepared as possible is another one. Um, what was the feedback from the teachers? The teachers absolutely loved it. Um, I think, like I said, they haven't really seen each other and worked with each other very much. Also to see um, the students get so excited to see the teachers do real science. I think that was cool. Um, I'm going to go back to these other questions because I know uh, Rodney and Katie are up next. Um, so um, I want to introduce Rodney again one more time. Rodney is the science director for Newport News Schools. Um, Rodney, if you want to, um, there is a slide here that they can see, and I think you can see it too. If you kind of want to just talk about what we did back in September and October, that would be great. And then Katie, you jump in as well after that. I'll start with what we've traditionally done that in the past for uh, I guess about the last three years, maybe four, we have uh, provided a MeWe experience for all sixth graders in our school system. So that's like approximately 2,100 students. And our school district is a complete uh, full and uh, reduced lunch school system. Every one of our schools would uh, qualify for Title I if they applied for the program. We only do it for elementary, but our middle school would be able to do that. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for these students to be able to get out and to this type of environment because it's not something that's familiar to them, but we feel like it's very important for them to understand it because they're the ones who are gonna be responsible for it as they get older and get into the workforce and, and so forth. And so we've also done some trips with our uh, high schoolers on uh, independent levels. I've received grants through Chesapeake Bay or you know, somebody like that. We've planted trees on Prescott Island. We've had a team come sleep in, in the uh, houses on Prescott. So we've kind of worked this, not just sixth grade, but we've allowed the high schoolers some opportunities as well. But with COVID-19 this year, obviously uh, trips were not an option. S students weren't in school. And so Nat, Katie, James, and myself, and my team, Amanda Ryerton and Patty Chaney sat down and kind of just developed a way that if we couldn't bring the students out on the trips, then how could we bring the trips to the students? And so we worked it out to where uh, Amanda's kind of our middle school specialist. She looked at our curriculum and worked with James and Katie on developing lessons that would align directly to our curriculum that's aligned with the state's curriculum as well. And because we have eight, seven, eight middle schools, 
there's so many different classes going on. We set it up to do a two day uh, presentation for each of the lessons. And basically they were doing about four presentations a day on a live feed for the students and the teachers. And for those teachers and students who, whose schedule was not aligned, Katie and James also uh, videoed their Zoom with all the uh, extra curricular materials that, that went with it. And so those students were still able to see the lesson and participate in the virtual field trip experience. Yeah, this was definitely new for us. Um, we wanted the kids to be able to go out on the field trips. And I was like, how, how do we do this? And Amanda came up with this great idea. She said, why don't you guys teach like you're normally teaching, but record it? So that's exactly what James and I did. Um, I just kind of had in my mind that like, okay, this camera in front of me is a student and I'm going to go out here and I'm going to give it all I got like I usually do. And hopefully we can still impact them because like Rodney was saying they are our future you know we have to get them to care about something and I think the best way to do it is if they're out there and they're hands-on and if they can't be hands-on we got to do it as best as we can um, so we created a living shorelines curriculum that was new this year that was actually through a grant with our restoration team um, the one thing that I talked to the kids about it is some people don't like wetlands okay so they drain wetlands and they want to build houses and they want those beautiful views, right? So our wetlands are gonna be taken away. Living shorelines is where we say, uh-oh, um, I'm having issues, I'm having erosion and my house is gonna go into the water soon. So what can I do? So our restoration team has been awesome. Um, they applied for grants and they're going out to homeowners homes. Um, they're putting plants that live out there. Um, it's, it's just the coolest thing. So we went out and we went to one of the homeowners homes and we filmed a video and showed them what a living shoreline actually is. And we created these little demo boxes and we used a pusher to show how water goes up and it goes up higher and eventually it's gonna hit the houses. Um, then we ended up taking oyster shells and putting them in the way and then made another line of plants and we pushed it again and the water just stopped so they can see how it's actually you know it's helping the houses and it's restoring our wetlands um another thing we tell the kids that all of this is all tied in together so wetlands are super important because they are going to filter out pollution um, they are going to prevent flooding for us and it's a great habitat for animals and then we always let the students know too that, hey, if your wetlands are working properly, if I go out there and I do water quality, um, that water quality is gonna come back good. And we also explained to them that there are two different ways that you can test it, biotic and abiotic. I always let them know bio means life. So if we're testing it um, with biotic, we're going out there, we're catching different species and we're being able to tell if the water quality is healthy that way. Um, abiotic is when we're seeing what the pH levels are gonna be, dissolved oxygen levels, what the salinity levels are like in the water. Um, and then when we talk about the watersheds, we let them know that all water is connected. Um, another huge program that we do is, um, it's, help me out, Nat, I just did it today, with the stencils. Oh, Paint yeah. out pollution, Paint yep. Pollution. <laughs> yep, so we do the storm drains. I was out there all day today um, with James City County Parks and Rec, and we were painting the storm drains, and we let people know that, hey, your river starts here, so whatever you're putting down these storm drains is eventually going to end up in the James River, and that's going to flow into the Chesapeake Bay, and then it's going to flow into the Atlantic Ocean. So we try to tie in all these lessons um, by filming these videos, but we started off our lessons with polls. We wanted to see where kids stood. Like, do you know what a wetland is? And we let them know, hey, if you don't know what a wetland is, that's fine. This is anonymous. No one's gonna know if you don't know what it is. And then we go through the lesson and then at the end, we launch another poll and they answer the questions and they actually get it right. I mean. The kids seem to have a really good time and I kind of like it that we had to do this. Um, we actually got to know the students because we were seeing the same students over and over and over again. So it was kind of cool to have that personal connection with them this time. So, I mean, we're learning too. So I always say that if you're an educator, you never stop learning. And this has definitely been a good experience of continuously learning for us. It's, a, awesome. it's, it's yeah, created so a whole different resource. 
Yes. I agree. And um, just to recap, so, and, and Katie and uh, Rodney chime in, um, with Newport News, we, we did basically had four virtual lessons that we did, and they all correlate to the SOLs, living shorelines, um, kind of Communi um, kind of connected to, to human impacts. Wetlands is, is, is definitely in the, the sixth grade SOL. Understanding watersheds and, and um, what rivers in Virginia flow into the Chesapeake Bay. And then of course, water quality. Katie talked about the abiotic and biotic. Students being able to, to basically conduct um, different tests and understand what those tests mean and, and how, how that impacts water quality of not just the James River, but the Chesapeake Bay. And so, um, it was pretty amazing. Um, I got to jump in on a bunch of these virtual lessons with Newport News, and sometimes there were 150 kids zooming in with with six or five or six different classes, and to see the kids engaged by answering polling questions and and you know answering questions verbally sometimes and um, responding to to um, to teachers and then sending their responses via email to us. And that gave us time to kind of answer students' questions as well. It was, it was really cool. Um, so let me just do a quick recap. Um, and then we're gonna take questions. And I think we'll have about 15 minutes to take, answer qu everybody's questions. I, I know I saw a bunch of them in the chat box. So um, right now I, I went over three different ways. We were doing virtual uh, lessons with Richmond City Schools through the EPA grant and the Model My Watershed. We engage teachers and students through virtually through field trips on our boat. That was kind of a new thing right at the end of the fall. And then of course with Rodney, we did every sixth grader um, that first semester. It was a literally, literally over a thousand students. We're gonna do it again this spring. We'll be another thousand students. And we did these four different virtual lessons. Um, it, it was really interesting and um, uh, I'm ready for your questions now. So I'm going to go to this last slide questions and I'm going to unshare myself. And if you have a question, you can drop it in the chat box. Or if you want to just unmic yourself and ask the question, we can do that too. So if you, if you want to like raise your hand, you can, you can do that. I think there's, there's a way to raise your hand in zoom as well. Charles, if you, oh, Aaron, go ahead. You want to read a question? There's, there's a quite a few questions that have come in that Charles has answered some of them, but I've, I've written down the ones that haven't been answered. So do you want to start with those? Sure. That sounds great, Erin. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll work back from what we just talked about <laughs> since those sections are fresher in our mind. So um, looks like Charles was able to answer Michael's question, but um, I'll just ask it because it's, I think it's a good one. How do you get full participation from the students and do you emphasize vocabulary? Okay, great question, Michael. Um, so to get like 100% participation is not easy. Um, even when I was teaching live in the classroom for 17 years in Henrico, um, I had to call on kids that were not would not raise their hand. And it's not any different with virtual, you know, um, we definitely have some kids that have no problem typing questions in the chat box or, or typing them in the sticky note on the jam board. Um, but I, to say we, we're going to get 100% participation um, every time is, is, is really hard. Um, and and I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I enjoy doing the virtual lesson, but I'm going to tell you there's nothing like face-to-face -face and hands-on learning. Um, and so when COVID's hopefully done here when we when when the pandemic's over and we're all all get our shots in the arm um i'm be i'm going to be very excited to get back to hands on I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you but but for right now i'm i'm okay doing the virtual <laughs> all I think right the polling me, too the polling too actually helps a lot with that participation so yeah we, and we could yeah we could have showed you the polling tonight too i thought it was a little bit too much but basically um you know, I don't know, Charles, if you want to try to create a quick polling question, we could do it right now and, and send it out. But basically, you, you, I think some of you have done it. We, we pose a question, the kids all kind of click on the answer and we can see the results and we can see how many kids responded. Um, so, you know, if we have 25 in the class and 23 respond, we, we know only two kids missed out. Um, so the polling questions is a great way to see how many kids are responding. It's a great way to grab their, their attention. So, yes. And I would Aaron, say... One of our classes that we work with, actually three of them in the Richmond area are predominantly Spanish. 
Um, so all the translations that we're doing is happening in the chat. Um, so the chat's the largest response that we get. Um, most students feel comfortable in the chat versus kind of verbally. Um, so I would definitely say that with our lessons, we have a lot large response in the chat. All right, Aaron, you want to throw another question at us? Sure. We have a couple left over from the field trip section. So I'll ask those. Um, one is, how did students participate in the field trip virtually? Did they simply watch or was there an element where they could interact digitally? Yeah, so they definitely were interacting. Um, it was a large group of students. Um, I want to say it was around 100 to 105 students that were on the Zoom meeting with us. But um, so we had the five teachers on the boat. And you kind of can see in the video, did you see that we were doing this thing called the 360 scavenger hunt and the kids had five questions and I was asking them a, a, a question about schooling fish. Um, and that, you know, why do fish like to school and instead of swimming individually. And so you, we, we were able to, to um, unmike the students and you heard the student answering the question about schooling fish. Um, so that's kind of how it worked. They also could put answers in the chat box. Um, the teachers knew their kids, so they were actually calling on them. They're like, hey, Charlie, answer number two. Um, so we were able to do that um, as well. We also got off the boat and got to go to Presque Isle, which is our a, a national wildlife refuge that we partner with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And there we talked about native and invasive plants. And the kids got to, we basically just took the iPad out and, um, you know, what, we all walked up on the land and we, we filmed two different types of plants and talked about native and non-native species as well. So that was kind of cool for the kids to do that as well. Um, and for the field trip, Nat, did you get special permission? Yeah, so um, we just worked through Henrico County and the teachers um, all agreed with the principal. The teachers did have to sign a waiver um, and they all felt comfortable. Um, I don't think any of them, um, you know, they didn't have to go on the field trip. Uh, I know the principal asked them and, and, and said, you know, if you don't, if you want to stay back, that's fine. And I know one teacher did stay back and kind of ran the computer, but I don't think any of them had a problem um, with that. One of the teachers had already been on the boat and I think explained to the rest of the teachers that it was a pretty large space. We'd be outside the whole time. Um, and I think risk of COVID was, was, was really low and we, we didn't have any problems. So. Yeah. And then just a few on the model my watershed section and, and then we can go to the more general questions. Okay. Um, it looks like we answered this one, but question about platform in which the simulator, the simulation was created. Yep, Charles, you mind doing that one? Yeah, not at all. Um, so the Stroud Reach Water Research Center um, in that, sorry, I, I wanna make sure I'm getting all of their information correct as well. Um, that's watershed modeling STEM, um, sorry, and I don't have it pulled up anymore. Um, but yeah, so it's the Shroud Water Research Center, um, if that answers the question. Yep, and they, Charles and I met with one of their educators and he kind of trained us a little bit one day. And then basically you really just had to kind of jump in and dive in. And we were really looking for something that talked about stormwater and runoff. And so that whole model my watershed is all about runoff and, and infiltration and stormwater. And I will tell you in that grant, each school gets $3,000 to Im implement their own best management practice. We hope to do that in March and April and have student impact, um, you know, input with that. That's not going to be the easiest thing in the world, but we have some really great teachers and I, um, you know, we're going to kind of work together to see how we can achieve that. Thanks, guys. Um, just a couple more on that. Uh, how many hours did it take to build the rain off simulators? So, yeah, so the runoff simulators were built by Stroud. So all we had to do is really learn it. Um, we, yeah, we didn't really build that, um, that simulator. So that was a really good question. We basically, um, I, I guess, borrowed it. <laughs> it's a good way, good way to say it. And then how much background knowledge did you provide on BMPs before doing this? 
Yeah. So the teachers, um, it's, it's like a two to three week lesson. And so we, I, we did create a project for the teachers to introduce BMPs, um, you know, things that they would be at their school and, and BMPs are best management practices. So like instead of using a, a roof of a school, a BMP would be introducing a green roof to a school because the green roof would reduce runoff um, from all the water going through the gutters. Um, also pervious and, and non-pervious surfaces. So, you know, one of the schools could use their $3,000 to rip up a parking spot and make it a pervious um, a, or porous parking area. So if they could get the permission from Richmond City Schools to rip up their parking lot and, and put in a new parking area or spot to kind of be a demonstration, um, that's, that could be their project. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the answer to that. Okay, great. Um, and now we're back to more general questions. These are actually from the very beginning, uh, kind of when we were talking about Jamboard and engaging students online in general. Um, so how much effort has been put into making teachers aware of these resources? Did you send them to specific teachers or to all schools? That is a great question. And so um, probably the best person to answer that is, you know, is Rodney. We, we sent them to all the um, science directors. So Henrico County has a, a K through five science director named Judy Christopher. They have their six through um, 12th is um, Eric Rhodes. Obviously, Rodney, he's in charge of all the teachers, science teachers in, in Newport News. So we sent that stuff to um, Rodney and some of them uh, and, and, you know, across our watershed. Remember, we have we have three offices. We have one in Lynchburg, one in Richmond and one in Williamsburg. And, and each of my educators has connections to those different schools. Rodney, do you want to I, I know you guys you knew about the virtual classroom stuff. I know you sent the information out to them. I don't know. You probably don't know how many have used it or anything like that. Now, uh, well, obviously, all the sixth grade teachers did because it's aligned to their curriculum. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it would be a resource possibly if a eighth grade teacher needed it to review for SOLs when because it's a three year test. And so this would be a good way to uh, identify some of the major uh, content areas for them to to use for that review portion. So but all of my all of probably eight schools, about 28 teachers probably have it right up front because they've used it. Thanks. Aaron, I, I know we got a couple, five more minutes to throw a couple more questions. If anybody has any more, go ahead and type them in there. Yeah, we have some. We have some, okay. two more from the beginning and then we have some at the end I saw. So um, are you having any issues with any schools not being able to use Zoom? Yeah, so that is a great question. I don't know who asked, asked that question. It's really good. Every school system, Meredith, is that you, Meredith? It My, was Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith, you are asking the good questions tonight. Every school system uses a different platform. And, you know, for us to remember, like, who uses what is not easy. Um, Rodney, you guys were mostly Zoom, I think, right? Richmond City is, is Google Meets. Um, Henrico is Microsoft, not Office, Microsoft Classroom. So, yeah, so they're all using different things. Um, Lynchburg, I can't remember what Lynchburg uses, but but yeah, that's that's definitely a tough thing, um, Meredith, to kind of keep track of. Um, but yeah, we, we, we've had to cross train each other to kind of use. I know um, Katie is loves Zoom. I don't think she loves Google Meets as much. Maybe I, I don't know, Katie. You can speak for yourself. No, well, you know, at first I didn't like Zoom because there's so many things that you have to learn. Like, and, and you learn. I mean, we're learning this entire time. Like the very first week, like we didn't know you can mute all the students, so the kids are like all talking, and we're like, okay. And then you don't know that the kids could change their name and they can draw on the screen. So it's like, you're, you're learning as you're going, but as soon as like you seem to understand and then you work with a different school system and they do Google um, Hangouts or, or Meets and you have to learn it all over again, so. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and I wish I could tell you that all kids were perfect angels, but they're not. Um, so I won't lie to you that we've had a couple of the high school kids, you know, probably test us with, with um, 
you know, putting pictures in the text box and we've had to drop them and, and then report them to their, you know, their teachers and principals. The teachers are always on the Zoom meeting with us. So they see what's going on. Um, but we haven't had a ton of that, you know, just a little bit. Um, most of the kids are appropriate. They want to learn. You know, if they don't want to learn, they don't even come. Some, you know, some of them, unfortunately, don't come to the Zoom. There's not a mandatory, you know, attendance for this right now. You know, um, I know um, each school system kind of handles it differently. And I would just add to that, that with Zoom, there's more um, like protection, I would say, to where you can streamline all information to you versus to all the students. And yep. Google is still kind of wild, wild west to where students can uh, take over the screen and put whatever in the chat and it's harder to kick them out. Um, so Zoom is a, a, a easier platform to control. And Microsoft Teams, if we had that, um, that is the most secure. Um, but yeah, yeah no, we have the chat just for us when we do zoom like the kids can't talk to each other we let them know hey guys like if you're in the chat we see it it's not going to your friends because but they will they'll be like hey i see my friend can i see my friend can i talk to my friend so yeah i think you guys brought up a really good point you know we're still obviously we've been thrown into this bubble of virtual learning and um you know we, we're we're learning every week on how to handle different situations um so I've been really, I, I need to be honest with you, I've been really proud of my team to be able to go from something they've never done before to, I, I really think we're, in some ways, we're doing things that um, are really outside the box. Um, and I think um, we're doing it safely. I think we're doing it in a very effective way that correlates to the, the SOLs and, and the teacher's goals of, of interacting students. So um, that's that's been a, uh, I've been really happy with that. Um, so, have you used platforms such as Nearpod or Peer Deck? Reasons you do or don't use them? Very good question. I don't know who asked that question. Nearpod, we just started learning about Nearpod last week through um, some RPS teachers. We have a we have a, a grant that we're working on with River City Middle School and also MLK Middle School in Richmond, and they like to use Nearpod. And so I need to be honest with you, we've done a little bit, but that is going to be another new technology that we're going to have to learn. But, um, but we have checked it out. It is pretty powerful. Um, so yeah, we're going to learn that. And another question about field trips. Do you offer pre and or post activities to go along with the field trips? If so, do you have a way of knowing if teachers and students are finding them useful? Maybe some type of feedback form or counting the number of website clicks. Wow. All right. You guys are asking really good questions. <laughs> uh, so with the boat trip, the, the five boat trips, we did two with Henrico and three with Hopewell. One of the cool things we did was a fish survey. So we caught fish in the trawl net. We put 20 of them in a tank and we had the teachers measure. Did you see in the video, they were measuring the diameter or the length of, in centimeters of each fish. And they were also IDing the fish. So if we got a white perch, they would say white perch, 10 centimeters. Um, a blue catfish, six centimeters. And so the kids then had to take that data back to school the next day with their teachers and they had to create a bar graph of the fish species and also um, the number of species they, that we caught out of that 20. So if we, caught, if we caught 20 fish and six of them were catfish and two were white perch and three were hog chokers, they had to make a graph. So that kind of is an example of what we've taken in my opinion of a post evaluation. Um, you know, and so I think, some I think of the teacher, I'm sorry, some of the teachers that we're working with in RPS um, will do exit tickets to where they are, you know, asking prompted questions and getting that feedback. And they have recently shared those with us um, because we're wrapping up several lessons with them. Um, so we do have those exit tickets. And then another great question from Meredith. Building off of that, uh, I was wondering what type of metrics for grants you are using and if you had to pivot to different metrics because of COVID changes. 
Yes, we have definitely been pivoting. I feel like all I've been doing is pivoting in like a 360 degree circle. Um, yeah, so we are very lucky. The people that have been working with us with grants, the EPA, NOAA, um, you know, other smaller grants, they have been very um, understanding of having to, you know, about face and change the way we educate. And um, we've, We've, we've been trying to, some of the metrics is just the number of kids that we've, you know, that are joining us on the virtual. We, we are trying to track that. We are trying to track, you know, if they're using, you know, if they're conducting the graphs with teachers and we're asked teachers to send us the graphs um, to share with the funders or, or the, you know, the grant um, people that are, have funded the grants. So um, I think that answers your question when it comes to like, really high level metrics um that that's been really tough i think that's basically it um but you know feel free if i've missed you i apologize and feel free to <laughs> to write your question again in the chat bar but i think that's everything great i think um I think Rodney had to leave. I I, I know he had a, something else going on. Um, he did. Yeah, he yeah. had he had another Zoom at seven. Yeah, but um, I wanted to really quickly um, let me share my screen, and I think it's seven o'clock. But I do have my email up here. Um, I think Charles, can you see that there? Yep. So it's ndraper at thejamesriver.org. And if you have any questions, um, send them to me. If it's a question that relates to Katie or Charles with what they're doing, I will gladly forward the email to them and they can help answer that question as well. Um, but yeah, just to make it easy, just send them all to me and then I can um, answer the question or I can have Charles or Katie fill them out.